when I was looking at their statements, um, it was a combination of the rent roll and their statements. And I was like, something here is, is not adding up, you know, like you're showing your rent roll, you know, at X, Y, Z, but then your effective income on your statements is like a $200,000 less. I'm so confused. And what it ended up being is that they weren't showing the concessions that they were giving on either of these documents. Welcome to the Share the Wealth Show, where minority professionals can learn to escape the racial wealth gap and catapult themselves into abundance. Your host, Nicole Pendergrass, grew her net worth from being negative to multiple six figures. Join her on her investigative mission to expose secret strategies of the wealthy so we can all have the tools needed to build the life and legacy we were created to possess. Now it's time for the show. Hey guys, so we're back again. This is the second part of the episode with today's guest. I need you, if you have not heard part one, go back to the previous episode and listen to that first and then come back and join us here today. You need to hear the whole conversation. This is why we split it into two parts. There's so many nuggets, it's so juicy. Go back and listen to the first part. I think you mentioned that there were like three main inputs that you need to you know, at least have at the very beginning to start your underwriting process? What what are those three? Is that for any particular asset type individually or it could be across the board? Across the board, what uh, uh, for me um, as an underwriter, I would need three main things to really get started. And that's one, a current rent roll, um, uh, a, a current you know, profit and loss statement, preferably in a T12 form. And what, what do I mean by T12? It's a trailing 12 statement. So going back the last 12 months of income and expense broken out on a monthly basis. Um, and then I, your, and it doesn't have to be super in depth, but, you know, a high level uh, a breakdown of, of your experience, you know, your portfolio and uh, your net worth and liquidity, you know, financial wherewithal. And we don't need to put together complicated personal financial statements, but to understand, you know, what your experience is, um, you know, your, your, um, your partner's experiences too, if you have partners that are, you know, own, 25% more interest uh, um, interest ownership in the deal, then those are going those are the types of partners that are going to be underwritten and looked at as well later on. So just understanding the overall sponsorship financial wherewithal in the beginning on a high level isn't is is very important in addition to the rent roll and T12. Okay. So now the rent roll and T12 are more like for analyzing the deal. The mm -hmm financial wherewithal and, you know, net, net worth, liquidity, all that of you and the partners are is more underwriting you um, personally. So if that part of it is more for the financing, right? Like, because lenders are going to look at you as well as the deal. So is that what you help people get together and make sure they have all their ducks in a row before they submit their package to a lender? 100%. And it's really important to understand um, what documentation you need to start gathering and putting together. You know, I, I, I had a conversation with one of, uh, not one, my lending partner uh, a couple weeks ago about um, a potential uh, construction development deal that we were possibly looking to engage with. And the equity wasn't there. The experience wasn't there. And that's okay, you know, if you are, and that's not to say that if you're a, a a person stepping into commercial real estate and you are in the beginning stages of building up your portfolio and getting into the game, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, get financing. It just means that you need to secure an experienced development partner or an experienced property manager. Um, uh, make sure that you have your equity backed and and like set down, it's done, it's deployed, you know what I mean? Um, to make sure that you can show like, hey, yeah, sure, I'm I'm a beginner investor, 
but here are all my partner's credentials and that will make you that that will get you into the game. Um, and that's what we really need to understand in the beginning, too, because if you don't have that, then a lot of lenders won't even look at the deal. Okay. So that's actually really good to know because that was another thing I would was going to ask was about people new to the space and wanting to get in. And I think a lot of concern for newer investors is how can they get the financing? You know, like how, where are they getting that from and how are they doing that? And I don't think a lot of them know that um, this experience level um, is, is actually something that the banks look at um, and that the way to overcome that is by partnering with somebody who is experienced. But then also you said your property management company just could be a very experienced company. So even if you wanted to third party manage, maybe you start out using the property management company who has experience learning from them and developing. And after you've had a deal for a year or two, then you could start slowly taking over the management for that. And now you're starting, you have more experience yourself and now you can say okay look i have three years experience doing this and i've been self-managing for two of those years or whatever but at least to get your foot in the door it's all about the team that you surround yourself with um so that's that's some great great advice now what i forgot I don't, I don't even know. I just was like on in my head where I was taking this next, this next question. But um, I think for, for people who are just trying to figure out if a deal even makes sense before they're even figuring out like how they should be underwritten themselves, um, do you also help with just, and you said it could be on a retainer type of basis, or it could be a, a one-off deal. They just contact you for underwriting a deal and you, you know, you help them with that. But do you also say, look, um, this deal is great, but make sure you are set up appropriately or a lender is not going to finance this deal because you don't have enough liquidity or or experience in it. Do you kind of give them that as like a forewarning if they don't even know that that's something they should be looking at? That's, that's one of the first things that we talk about. It's all about transparency up in here. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That if you're not transparent about those things in the beginning, what kind of service are you actually providing? You know, it, 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 Investors need to know, I, and I don't I feel like it's our duty. I feel like it's our duty to explain these things up front and in the beginning because, um, and then it's a reciprocal relationship too. You know, if, 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 if we on the finance side and the underwriting side are asking you these questions um, specific in the beginning to set you up for success, then, you know, be prepared to answer them with integrity, right? Be prepared to answer them honestly. So, you know, we can put you in front of the lenders that are going to have the 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 most appetite for your type of deal and for your type of sponsorship group and, you know, org structure, whatever the case may be. And then, you know, that way your deal is just going to move that much quicker through the process. We don't have to worry about it being, um, uh, you know, scrutinized later on, or if being retraded later on, or dying later on, you know what I mean? The 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 likelihood of your deal moving toward closing faster and more efficient is, you know, very contingent upon us being honest, you know, with you and you being honest with us. Okay. Now, over your years of experience um, underwriting so many different kinds of deals, do you have any like examples or any deals that come to mind where everything looked good like on the surface, but upon like further underwriting, you know, someone had brought you a particular deal that you looked at and you were like, uh, what are you thinking? Like, how did you, why did you underwrite it like this? Because it's a Someone who's looking at investors, looking at deals, going to do at least some numbers first and then bring it to you for further analysis. But 
Or have you seen it where their numbers are just so complete, their assumptions are really off? Like, what's like the craziest, I guess, or or most like, not divergent, but, you know, someone brought you a deal that they thought was going to do X, Y, Z, and you looked at it and you were like, that's completely off. That's not going to happen. Looking to build wealth with real estate? Are you all tapped out on YouTube University and ready to get help tailored to your specific situation and goals? Have you always known that you were a little different from the crowd, that you never liked following the status quo, and that you're just tired of living in mediocrity? You want to build wealth on your own terms outside of Wall Street? Well, you know, then maybe the Microfamily Mavericks mentorship program can help with that. It's a community where I handhold you through the process of buying your first small commercial multifamily building because not everyone is ready for 100 units out the gate. Why multifamily? because it gives your rental income a hedge against vacancy. Imagine what happens when your single family rental tenant leaves, right? And why commercial five plus units? Because you have much more control over increasing the building's value in the commercial space, and then in turn, increasing your own net worth. Starting small is a stepping stone to so much more because then you can tap that equity and buy another building and another and another, and you get the point. So increasing your cash flow and your ability to be job optional along the way. It's all a part of the journey. So if you think big, but you want to start small, and if you know multifamily real estate is the way for you to open the door to building a life of freedom, abundance, and legacy, but you just need someone to guide you step by step, and you want to be surrounded by other people on the same journey, doing the same thing, then just click the link in the show notes to find out a little bit more about the Microfamily Mavericks and I look forward to potentially seeing you on the inside. So now back to the show. Uh, I was working on a uh, pre-stabilized multifamily property in Louisiana. And Louisiana markets aren't exactly, you know, the 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 the, the tip of the top, right? Like they're they're uh they're great markets you know what i mean but for a lot of the the lenders out there they're they're a pre-review market meaning like the the deal really needs to be largely vetted and approved like through committee before even moving forward because it's such a a, a transitional market so this deal um was in lisa and we were largely, you know, projecting, right? It's 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 on a pro forma basis because they're, you know, leasing up the 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 new construction. Um, and when I was looking at their statements, um, it was a combination of the rent roll and their statements. And I was like, something here is is not adding up, you know, like you're showing your rent roll, you know at X, Y, Z, but then your effective income on your statements is like a $200,000 less. I'm so confused. And what it ended up being is that they weren't knowing the concessions that they were giving on either of these documents. There were no concessions being shown on the rent roll and there were no concessions broken out on the the operating statement and i was trying to put two and two together and they didn't they weren't exactly transparent about it either they didn't divulge like hey we're offering conclusions you know what i mean and we asked we specifically asked like hey you know i do my due diligence it says on your website that you're offering concessions oh no no, no. The, the, they've burned off they've burned down we're not offering concessions anymore i'm like okay well yeah, it turns out that when it got into underwriting with the lender, we weren't adding up and boom, we finally got a report that showed all of the concessions. And we had to do this whole like net rent effective analysis because they hadn't burned off. They hadn't burned off. And then on top of that, they were still offering concessions. So that was pretty hairy. We got through it, but it was it was a pretty hairy deal. Wow. So even with all of that, you still were able to get it funded? We did. We got it funded by um, a creative bridge lender. It died with the initial lender that we had, you know, got under app with. And keep in mind, there are some non-refundable fees that, that go into signing up these apps. 
you know, so that's money lost there too for the sponsor. Like, just, just, just tell us what's up, you know, in the beginning. Yeah. Be that's good. A, that's what you said. The transparency on the operator and investor side and on your side, like everyone has to work together to make this um come to fruition. The the thing though that you said that I want people to pull uh pull out away from that is that if you are looking for a deal that someone is offering for sale, that's another thing that you should be looking at, making sure numbers, just the, the way Nikki was looking and doing her due diligence and making sure that the numbers made sense and that things were aligned, that like if there is a huge gap between what you're really seeing on the P&L and what's happening on the rent roll, there, there has to be something explaining that. And maybe the seller is hiding concessions or other information because they want to increase their NOI. Like if they boost their NOI, that boosts their purchase, their um their valuation, right? But you don't want to buy a building that is offering concessions and all and that you weren't planning for. Now all of a sudden your your um lease subs decrease because you're not offering concessions anymore and everyone's used to the concessions. You know, like so that's the that's something that really could that's like a big red flag even with her and with you as an investor looking at deals. And that's why you need someone like Nikki and your team who can sniff out that kind of stuff and be like, look, man, something's not adding up here. Something's fishy and you will get to the bottom of it. And it's great having someone like her as well, just because then she can still pivot and find a lender who can make it happen and still, still get to the bottom of things. And so talking about like getting lenders uh, who are in alignment or are just like making things, making deals work. I know right now is a pretty hairy time in commercial real estate, especially like in multifamily, there, there's some stability happening, I guess. But the lending aspect of it with the rate increases over the past year have been a huge concern for a lot of people. And um, everybody's interested in the financing, right? Like how do we get the money to do the deals? <laughs> so what have you seen recently as far as what lenders are requiring and what they're maybe like their their loan to value that they're making are they requiring more experience more equity like what are some of the holdups that you see happening that are, have been changes in and making lending stricter and fall you know potentially even falling through you know i've heard of a lot of deals falling through at the 20 23rd hour, you know? So what, what are some of those things that are happening and bubbling under the surface that investors looking to get in should be aware of when they're looking for lending? I think the, I think the most important part about that, about responding to that question is starting off by saying you need to understand what type of lender you want to do business with where you know you know how we say okay i, I i'm an investor <clears throat> and i have a specific criteria of the type of properties that i invest in right the lenders are the same way lenders all have specific appetites they have specific boxes of how they look at deals and what type of asset types they're going to look at um so i think it's important to know where you fall into that space, where your deals fall into that space. Um, I mean, as just as I, I actually have some real time information here. So like I've worked with, um, you know, banks, uh, life companies and the agencies and debt funds, right? And but by the agencies, I mean, uh, the government sponsored enterprises, the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, you know, stuff like that. They hold the market share for multifamily. They don't do capital markets, but um, you know, all of these different types of lenders that I just men mentioned, look at LTV, um, like, like they look at LTV, they look at, uh, um, you know, DSCR, maybe a little bit differently than others do. So for example, like life companies today, they'll go up to, you know, 70% of cost, um, maxed out at 65% of stable value, right? Um, you can get interest only with them. Uh, you can get a 25 or 30 year amortization with the life companies. I think you're going to see more 25 year, um, uh, you know, depending on the deal. But um, on a permanent loan basis, you can gauge, uh, you know, the 10 year treasury is always a good, I think, yield index to go by. 
So for the life companies, you're looking at 200 to 250 spread over the 10 year treasury. Um, they're non-recourse and they are picky about sponsorship, right? So the life companies prefer institutional investors. They prefer investors that have, um, I, I break down the, the level of experience between low, moderate, and high. Are you enjoying this episode? Then stop what you're doing right now. Head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It really helps our show get pushed to more people who are looking for the information that we're sharing here. We have to share the wealth. If you listen to us on YouTube, make sure you like the episode that you're listening to right now and subscribe to our channel. Then share the channel with somebody else. There are people out there looking for the information you're listening to right now. So make sure you share it with someone who you know needs it. Now back to the show. They want a high level uh, experience sponsorship group for bank financing, right? You can get up to 75% today. Um, you know, they're, they're more active in the five year funding money space. And you're looking at, you know, 250 to 300 over the, the treasury, right? Um, those are full recourse. And they require some level of experience. They're not as picky as the life companies. So they that can be, you know, I think we see a lot of beginner investors start with banks because they have um, they have a more open minded credit box and level of experience when it, a level of appetite requirement uh, for for beginner investors. So we'll see beginner investors, you know, start with the banks and then when they you know, start rolling with their portfolio and getting more experience, you can move on to different kinds of lenders. Um, so, I mean, those are just some examples of, of, of what we're seeing in the market today. Again, the agencies are going to be for multifamily. They hold the market share. I think they're always going to. And they look at deals, you know, on a basis of basically it's a it's a it's a combination between LTV and debt service coverage ratio. So it'll be the first box is up to 80% on a 125 debt service coverage ratio. The second box is lower tiered, which is at 65% um, and a 135 debt service coverage ratio. And then the last one would be 40, uh, 55% loan to value and then a 155 debt service coverage ratio, 145 to 155. And that being said, the lower your LTV is in that 55 to 65% space, I think today with any lender is going to be the deal that is going to be highly prioritized. It's less risky for the lender and you have more skin in the game. You're coming in with more equity, you know, 35%, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So basically if your, your LTV, your loan to value is lower because you're bringing more down payment or whatever to the deal. Um, and your debt service coverage ratio is now higher because you have less debt. So now that's something that is more appealing to the banks. And um, what I wanted to do is also break down like, LTV and DSCR and the uh, 250 or 300 basis points, what do those terms kind of mean just for people who are newer and understanding lending terms? So your loan to value is, uh, is a percentage and it's basically um, the percentage that of, of the loan amount that you're going to be given by the lender. So if your property is you're purchasing a property for whatever X, Y, Z amount, and you want a 75% loan, your loan is going to be 75% of whatever number, which means that you're coming in with a 25% equity down payment. Um, the debt service coverage ratio is basically the coverage ratio that shows how much your cash flow supports your loan. Um, so if, you know, let's say your, um, if you're at a one debt service coverage ratio, that means that you're between, you know, your 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 um your loan and your expenses and all that, you're breaking even, right? You're 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 breaking even. 
that's not very attractive, I think, to anyone for you as an investor, nor for a lender that's trying to lend you money that doesn't really, you know, um, make them feel super comfortable <laughs> um, in, in, in giving you a bunch of bucks. But, you know, typically, if you're at a, a one two five, right, um, that is that that that's a good place to be if you can prove that your property is operating at a one two five and your cash flow support supports your loan um ask at a one two five debt service coverage ratio you should be you know pretty good to go okay cool um thank you for those explanations um so what i want to do now is there anything else that you wanted to add about lending, debt, analyzation, making sure that you're looking at your numbers correctly, anything that people, especially like newer investors or people wanting to get into the game should really kind of look out when it comes to acquiring a deal. I definitely think that, you know, what you touched on earlier, and I'll just kind of, you know, go back to it because I think it's really important to highlight is that when you're trying to acquire these properties and you are requesting these due diligence items from the seller, if there is even a, a, a moment's pause where you're like, hmm, that don't seem right, or they're not very forthcoming, they're like, oh, we, we don't have a rent roll, we're just going to give you a unit mix, or we don't have, you know, a, a, um, a full year's worth of operating history, whether it's rolled up into one PL, that's fine too. But if they just want to like provide the last six months, I mean, that's a red flag. You know, if they're not going to want to provide you a full rent roll, that's a red flag. And what I would say to that um, is also don't be afraid to push. You know, some people in the, in these beginning stages, I don't think that they feel Com uh, comfortable enough or confident enough to say, well, this is what I really need. If you want to sell me this deal and you want me to be able to get the financing that I need from it, or if you want me to actually make you an offer that is the value that you're allocating to this property, give me the information that I need, period. And if they don't want to do it, don't be afraid to walk away either. It's okay. You'll find another one. <laughs> yeah. And actually that's a, that's a great point. I've heard people say like one of the best deals they did was the one they didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you have to be okay with walking away. So I actually was about to transition, but I got one last question because you were saying some of that stuff about P and L's and rent rolls and all that stuff there. What if you are targeting mom and pop type of sellers who are not, professional man, property managers and do not really run and, and keep track of their numbers like they should be, how do you kind of get, what, what do you do to get information to kind of, even if you have to compile your own P12 or PNL or whatever, um, because the seller truly doesn't have it, you know, like how do you evaluate the deal? Because I've definitely closed on a deal where it was, you know, mom and pop situation, the husband dealt with the real estate and he had passed a couple of years before. The wife really wasn't like she let some the guy who was helping her husband kind of continue running it. But she didn't have any documentation for us. So we were doing a lot of pro forma with not any, you know, backup, like hard evidence kind of to to help us with that inhalation. So what do you suggest people do in that kind of situation? I suggest that you, I think it's good to plan ahead, right? I think that it's inevitable, especially with the smaller size, and let's just focus on multifamily with the smaller size uh, multifamily properties, you know, you know, five units to call it 50, um, you know, you'll you'll you're you're more than likely to run into a situation where a seller doesn't have the best accounting resources available. So in knowing that, I would definitely educate yourself on what an actual p and l statement should look like and provide to you, you know, like what the income needs to have, right? in order for you to really assess it. It's you know, your gross potential rent, 
your vacancy, is there bad debt, are there concessions, right? Make sure that you understand what all of those terms mean, how they calculate. Um, know your market, right? If you need to pro forma, know your market. Uh, and then the expenses too, you know, especially real estate taxes and insurance these days, I would definitely make sure that you understand how those are reassessed per your county or whatever deal that, the, uh, um, you know, whatever municipality the deal is in. And then, you know, insurance is tough, right? Especially until you get your appraisal and shareable value and stuff like that. It's tough, but you can still reach out to very, you know, educated local commercial property um, insurance agents in, in the area or talk to people that have done a deal, right? Or talk to your local appraisers and see what they're thinking about insurable values and, and that'll help you too. The point is get prepared, educate yourself so that when you are presented with a situation where you have choppy numbers and you need to piece them together, you're able to do it efficiently and the knowledge um, to do it skillfully and then you can, uh, um, you know, put them together in a way that shows you the timeline. Maybe you can create your own T12, you know, maybe you can create your own T6, What you know, however, it, whatever information you have. Okay, cool. Love that. That's And that's also why it's very important to know your market. Or like you said, you could ask another investor who's maybe in the market, like talking to actually lenders or property managers and and seeing what they see as like standard expenses for certain line items and stuff and trying to piece to get together um as best you can but every market is a little different so you know you need to know your market and that's why I always am a proponent for especially newer investors starting with one market you know or two max because it's very hard to know to the level of detail you need to um if you're spread thin and you're doing like all these different markets even like if it's in the same state every market is you know is different and if you're getting to a situation where you need to analyze a deal and you don't know the standard expenses per unit you know for a particular market is harder for you to kind of piece that together and make sense of it. Um, if you come to a seller who doesn't have like all the accounting together, like you said. I'm glad that you brought that up too, because it it, it brings up another really um, important point that as uh, a sponsor, borrower, investor, um, especially in the beginning stages, if you are local and you are just only building your portfolio uh, in your local markets, that's a that is a main question that lenders are going to ask you. Uh, how close do you live to the property? How many properties do you manage or own within your market? That's a that's a really important, um, you know, aspect to the experience that lenders are going to look at. So thank you for bringing that up. It's it's important. Yeah, definitely. Well, I this conversation was just insane. Like you gave so many tidbits and drop so many gems and things I know people are not really paying attention to. And just like sharing your whole journey and how you got to creating your own, um, your own firm, Authentic CRE. Guys, I'm going to have the link to her firm in the chat, in the notes. So make sure you look her up and reach out when you're doing your deals and seeing how she can help you and assist you with making sure your underwriting is is together and everything is is in line so that you have the best chances of closing that deal. So what we're going to do now is we are going to transition to a segment called Digest with the Guest. These are the last four or five questions I ask every guest. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to someone who left an amazing review on Apple Podcasts. Um, so this is from See Me Fly. Uh, Much needed financial education. I love this podcast. I've watched Nicole build her brand. So to finally listen to her much anticipated podcast was a breath of fresh air. It's quite relatable to the everyday person and meets you wherever you are in your journey. Take a listen. You won't regret it. Lots of great guests and diamonds, diamond diamonds. Thank you. See me fly. Um, I love this, this review. Everyone, if you have not left a rating or review on Apple 
podcast, please do so. That helps us get conversations like this that we've had with Nikki today out to more people who are looking for this kind of information and it helps expand our reach and it helps us all level up together and get the information that we need, right? So digest it with the guests. Warren Buffett said, diversification is protection against ignorance. Um, so what do you take that to mean? Is that a good or bad thing? And how? Where are you, what are your views on that? Diversification is protected, is, pro, is protecting against ignorance. Yeah, protection against ignorance. I think that it means the more you know, the more equipped you are to handle very variable situations like you know um we say all the time that you know what i I forget what that phrase is but being a jack of all trades means that you're a master of none you know what i mean and Mm -hmm. i think fine you know but i think also being a jack of all trades means that you are very diversified and you can offer you know, expertise in many areas and walks of life. And I think that being able to be that type of persona and have that type of mind frame is very, very powerful because it means that you are able to look at situations from a different lens versus being ignorant about them. Yep. Love that. Um, you played Monopoly before? Yes. Okay. In the game of Monopoly, Boardwalk or Baltic, what's your first purchase if you had a choice and why? Shoot. Um, probably Baltic because I think it's cheaper and I might be able to build on it faster and then I can move on to Boardwalk. (laughs) Like that. Hey. Stepping stones, that's what I'm all about. Starting small and stepping your way, using that as a gateway to step up into the next investment and level up. Love it. Uh, What does wealth mean to you? I can tell you what it's not to me. Um, I don't think wealth is health. And I don't think broke is broken. I think that... I think that... For us to truly be wealthy, we need to have a very strong foundation first. Um, And I don't think that that comes from money. I think it comes from um, moving through life with good intentions and, and behavior and aligning yourself with you know, everyone that values what you value and making something really amazing come from it. Okay. I love that. Great answer. Okay. And then now we actually, we ask each guest to create a question for the next guest. Um, It can be anything, business, personal, funny, serious, whatever, whatever you want. I know you've thought of a question. I love your question. Um, But I'll ask you the last guest question first for you, which is what does black or brown, I'll add that in, black or breath, black, black or brown wealth mean? What does it mean? Yeah. It's very broad, open-ended question. I mean, I think, see, the, see I, I think of wealth in, in, in a different way. I don't always, I don't think about it when it comes to money, but I think for people like us, I think that wealth comes from creating a pathway for our future generations to walk in our footsteps. Um, I think it's really, really important. I know that, you know, I, I, for, I wish my dad had talked more to me about creating a pathway for people that look like me and you growing up. And I really want my son to be able to understand what that looks like and for him to be able to perhaps step into the shoes of running authentic CRE one day, you know, I've created a space for him to create generational wealth for himself and his kids as well. 
All right. I, I actually, I really love that. Um, so in a nutshell, is is more about making it generational, right? Making wealth generational and the knowledge behind it so that we can keep it generational after that, you know? Okay, love it. Now, you want to share the qu your question for the next guests? Sure. Mine is more funny, but uh, I think it went something like, you know, it's the zombie apocalypse, you know, the horde is is near and you have a short amount of time to grab three things from your home bef before you vacate it forever. What are the three things that you take? <laughs> I, have, I don't have sound effects, but that's my sound effect. Let me uh, clap. Um, I love that question because one, it does get to the mindset of like what's important to someone, but then two, it has a funny twist to it. Like a like something it's just like cultural culturally relevant doesn't have to be, you know, serious. I think it's the the first actually you no, know, one other person did ask a question that was not that was just a funny question, just off the wall question that had no really deeper meaning behind it. <laughs> it was just a funny question. So I love this. I love these uh, these segments. But in any case, I'll make sure to ask the next guest that question. And I can't wait to see what she says. I know who that's going to be. Um, but in any case, like this, that's a wrap. It's a wrap. Thank you so much, Nikki, for joining in with us today and being so authentic and just sharing so many insights like throughout this whole um conversation uh i can't wait for this to air for everyone to enjoy what you just shared with me this is fantastic thank you for having me it's it, it like we've been talking about it for so long and i'm just so happy to contribute to what you're doing because what you're doing is amazing so thank you for putting this on and sharing this with everyone because it's really important thank you Oh, thank you again. All right, everyone. We will see you the next time. Take care. Did you love this episode of Share the Wealth Show? Be sure to connect with Nicole by following her on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. If you picked up any of the gems that were dropped by today's guest, make sure you not only put them in your bag, but if you know of someone who would benefit from this information, don't keep it to yourself. Share the wealth and make sure to leave us a rating and review. We'll see you for next week's episode. Subscribe so you'll be notified.